This is TCS, the Tech Central show, formerly TC Daily, and I'm Duncan McLeod. Now, we might have a new name for this show, but you can still find us at the same place on YouTube. It's at youtube.com slash techcentral. If you go there, hit the subscribe button and hit the bell icon. You will never miss another show from Tech Central. Now, we've got a great guest in the studio today. Tim Humphreys-Davies is CEO of Pinnacle, the IT distributor in the Elviva Holdings Stable. Tim, it's great to see you. How are you doing? Good, thank you, Duncan. Nice to see you again. Thank yeah. you for having me. Pleasure. Thanks for coming coming through. Now, there's a lot happening at Elviva at the moment. Uh, the delisting, of course, there was the acquisition last year, I think it was, of Tarsus Technology Group could have been the year before. Really. Year before, yeah. Year before. It was effective July 21, I think, wasn't it? 21. I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah. 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 Time time flies. It's yeah. 2023 now. <laughs> so 2021, about 18 months ago. Um, all this corporate action within Alviva, what's the impact on Pinnacle? Not much. I mean, it's yeah. pretty much business as usual. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I mean, each distribution company, the three you know, Access, Tarsus, Pinnacle operate independently, separate balance sheets, separate management, separate board. Um, there is a small degree of collaboration in the back office on certain services and what have you. And we obviously report into the same you know, CFO and CEO of group. Um, so not real impact to us. I mean, it's great to have Tarsus in the group, incredible company. They do have some amazing services that the group have uh, made use of, not so much Pinnacle, um, it's great to have them on board. Um, yeah, so, so no real impact to us. Delisting a little bit more, um, mm-hmm. you know, as you know, um, that uh, on the 27th of, uh, of January, the shareholders voted overwhelmingly to accept the offer. Uh, I think it was 93% and 94%. So that will then now move forward to the effective date of 7 March. Uh, it doesn't affect Pinnacle or its staff or stakeholders in any shape, way or form in terms of business as usual, but just obviously the, the, you know, the visibility of Pinnacle and the distribution Mm. cluster obviously won't be there from a, from a reporting point of view. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's all going to be happening in the coming weeks. Correct. Yeah. Um, How's business out there at the moment? Uh, We, I mean, we were sitting in load shedding, constant load shedding, it seems now. Um, And we, we, we saw the, the numbers from the South African Reserve Bank earlier this week saying, that at stage six, it's costing the South African, South African economy 899 million rand a day. How is, uh, how is business out there in the IT distribution market? Look, it's a bit difficult to gauge really. I mean, you know, we've had load shedding every single day of 2023 and um, you know, it definitely impacts you operationally. Cost-wise, you can see the sort of short-term OPEX creep and things like diesel consumption and um, you know, other sort of non-direct costs. You know, mm-hmm. there are direct, uh, indirect impacts, you know, in your supply chain. From a demand point of view, I don't know if it's load shedding or the downturn or the over, you know, the normalization of supply in the last sort of in the end user compute space. So there are some sectors that have definitely contracted. So end user compute in terms of, you know, volumes, in the last two quarters have definitely contracted somewhere between 15 and 20%. You can see that in the IDC numbers, and we see that. So um, AWSP, you know, average um, selling prices have, have crept because obviously there's yeah. a, you know, th- th- sort of deterioration of the RAND. So it's a bit difficult to gauge um, the revenue, but the, the definitely the unit quantity is contracted. Mm-hmm. But having said that, then there are other areas like we've seen a resurgence in infrastructure spend, you know, where people have returned to the office. I think what load shedding has done, it's obviously a catalyst for certain things. You know, battery spend, inverter spend. Pinnacle's not mm-hmm. really in that space, so we haven't seen that. But a provision of UPS is, you also see replacement of load shedded equipment. Mm-hmm. You know, um, damage pretty, equipment. <laughs> damage, pretty prevalent, when you don't wish that on anyone, but there is a, there is a you know, it's a, as I say, it's a catalyst for some, some spend. Mm-hmm. But what we have seen in retail and speaking to the big retailers, the traditional brick and mortars is that they've seen spend basically go into what they call home improvement, you know, generators, da 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 da. So you've definitely seen, I think the biggest contraction is in the retail space. So that would then say there's definitely an impact on, on the economy. There's no doubt about it. I mean, you know, and then supply chains are just probably less reliable. Mm. I mean, you can just drive onto the roads and see yourself. Now, if you're a supply chain or last mile delivery, you know, freight forwarders, transit, I think people underestimate the impact that that's had. Even in the IT space? 
Yeah, the unreliability of ports. Mm. You know, you get a lot of fluid ETAs, um, you know, moving, which can constrain effective supply. And then you, suddenly your revenue drops. Mm. You know, you think you're going to drop, you know, a deal and the ship doesn't clear. Right. It, you know, so it can be a bit frustrating. Having said all of that, the sentiment that we get is, you know, you know, South Africans are resilient. They can no make choice. a plan. <laughs> yeah, there's no choice. You know? And I think particularly the IT sector is used to so many shocks. It's, I wouldn't say it's shock proof. Mm. And particularly at Pinnacle, we've always sort of encouraged this culture of anti-fragility, as we call it. Mm -hmm. You know, see it as an opportunity rather than a, a threat. Um, but overall, um, I, I mean, you know, I don't know if you saw this morning, you know, the SARS commissioner was very concerned about the tax revenue. And yep. that, that, that's really a kind of bellwether. Mm. In, in, I mean, it's hurting. It's, it's hurting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So some of these factors are unique to South Africa, particularly yeah. the stuff driven by load shedding. Uh, but of course, um, this is a global industry as well. And the global trends manifest themselves in the South African market, too. We've just seen uh, the uh, probably w one of, if not the worst, uh, quarters for PC sales in history. I think they were down something like forty percent in that yeah, region. Yeah. Um, wh what's that? Just, wh what are we seeing here in in South Africa? Are we seeing a similar similar, similar yeah. sort of drop? I don't think forty. I mean, uh, the contraction last quarter was twenty one percent. I think was. I think that was the okay. number, yeah, yeah. So not locally. as that, yeah, okay. locally, yeah. In sell-in, mm -hmm. uh, sell-out, we don't have visibility of. But if you look at some of the, you know, sort of the retail numbers, which we can see, yeah. you know, then it's, you might want to call it a bloodbath. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Okay, so the consu it's the consumer. That so the is consumer's it. constrained, is, is, yeah. is this just a, a, f a factor of um, consumers having spent money on new hardware during the pandemic because they had to work from home, et cetera, et cetera, and now they've got those computers, so they're not spending anymore. Yeah, I think it's a combination of factors, Duncan. So if you look, supply chain was constrained pretty much as we hit COVID or prior to that, mm. you know, with the, you know, Intel getting their production cycle out of sync and then obviously huge demand for, you know, end user compute at home and, and the constraint in supply often um, precipitates more demand. You know, if you feel like you can't get something, then you want to go out and get it. I think the spend then caught up mm. with, you know, the supply ca caught up with the demand. And I think there's a cycle, certainly in corporate. You know, people have probably done their replenishment cycles. Yep. In the semi, small, medium enterprise and end user space, I think inflation is a factor that people are not. You know, inflation creeps. You know, it, it reduces your your capacity for spend, and some of that um, combination of inflationary creep and diverting your your other purchases to keeping the lights on as such and greater OPEX costs, you, I think you've seen a big contraction in, you know, okay, so you've got Windows 11. Do I really need to go to Windows 11? Not quite. Let mm. me just hold. You know, do I really need to replenish my, you know, to Gen 13? Maybe not. Mm -hmm. You know, let's, we're on Gen 11. It works for me next year, maybe, you know. So, I mean, that's, that's not in, an empirical, that's just the sentiment that you kind of pick up with yeah. the resellers speaking to the end customers, that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, pricing pressures. Now, you mentioned inflation. Um, we, we know that uh, we've seen the inflation in s services, for example, you know, the price of Apple TV going up or the cost of cloud storage going up. Mm. But what we perhaps don't have such insight into, which I'm sure you do, is the inflationary pressures we're seeing in the PC hardware or just the hardware space more generally. Are we seeing those, um, I mean, we, we're seeing the U.S. On, sitting on an inflation rate, I think it's cre creeping quite close to 10%. It's over 10% in some parts of Europe. UK, yeah. Um, is this flowing through into higher costs for computers? Yeah, so we've always got that variable of rate of exchange. Mm. Yeah, but if you look at dollar price, yeah, it's, it's definitely. Up. So you had an Intel chip increase last September, you know, um, but I think the manufacturers are careful, you know, when... Supply is greater than demand, then typically, you know, people hold pricing or clear pricing. So m definitely on the new tech, the new den, you see a jump, but then you see end of life category, you know, clearing. Yeah. And then, and then, you know, if you were buying at 15 uh, rand to the dollar, and now you're buying this morning at 17.60, Mm -hmm. You know, you're going to see that creep in inflationary pressure anyway, but your raw dollar price has not gone up at the same 
delta mm -hmm. as the rate of exchange. If you compared the rate of exchange to this time last year, right. I mean, I don't have the exact number in my head, but it's, I know it's gone it's up. It's gone worse, yeah, yeah, gone yeah, worse, yeah. 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 So, so we were 15, I think. Okay. I remember, yeah. So it's more a rand dollar uh, factor than, than inflation that's causing our price, prices to rise. Look, I mean, those manufacturers are going to have inflationary pressure. Yeah. You know, but you've seen big tech cut heads. You know, mm. I mean, mm. it's obviously a lot of it is, you know, um, window dressing in terms of shareholder sentiment. And, you know, you saw Microsoft, you know, everyone does it just before they re release results. Mm. But it's a concern. I mean, over 100,000 jobs in, in the big. And very quickly. And very quickly, yeah. And especially when you see stalwarts like Google, you know, who are still incredibly profitable. Amazon, we understand, you know, he was saying that they overhired mm -hmm. Microsoft. Yeah, so, so those inflationary pressures on the input costs on manufacturing, they have to offset them with mm. some OPEX costs that you can control. So I, you definitely see that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, now obviously those job cuts that we're seeing in the US do manifest themselves here through the local subsidiaries of these big tech companies. There will yeah. be job losses in the South African context. But what about South African companies in the tech space? Are we seeing... Uh, pressure to cut jobs? Not, not at the moment. Not no. at the moment. No. no, I haven't seen it. I haven't seen the likes of the big VARs or software dev houses. I, mm -hmm. I, I don't know if you have, but I, mm -hmm. I certainly haven't seen it. I haven't. I mean, you speak to execs in the space. No one's saying we're, you know, we're going to do section one eight nine. I haven't mm -hmm. seen that. You've seen a bit of constraint maybe in people's profitability, but I, I don't see that sort of thing. You may see a bit of acquisition, you know. You may see that, but I don't think, you know, acquisition-related layoffs, but I, I don't think so, no. Okay, okay. Yeah, no, I'm not hearing anything no, either, so no. it, it doesn't seem to be translating into... I think you'll see some head cuts and some vendors in Southern Africa or some, yeah. you know, some contractions in maybe where we report into in the sort of EMEA-type regions. Mm. Could be. Yeah. Mm. So um, we spoke about the supply chain and the constraints we saw in the supply chain during the COVID period. Is that completely resolved now or are there still supply chain constraints? Pretty much some still areas? some constraints in the networking kit. Networking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, you mentioned earlier, you know, there's been a contraction, but the bubbles, well, not bubbles, uh, you know, uh, peaks of good spend, you know, like so networking and um, outdoor wireless and that kind of stuff, you still, still see big spend mm -hmm. or big demand. It's kind of normalizing now. But, you know, the big players, you know, mm. you know the Cisco's and, the, you know, the, the lead times were, were, were long mm -hmm. and they are getting better, but you still see pockets of, con, you know, constraint. Yeah. yeah. Um, it was a huge constraint in the GPU market, yes, graphics yeah, market. Yeah. That's gone. Now. That's gone, yeah. No, NVIDIA's on top of its game. Um, NVIDIA, from a vendor perspective, I mean, they're just a phenomenal... You know, that's an engine. I don't know if you've seen their market cap. It's yeah, massive. It's just yeah. massive, yeah. It's bigger than twice the size of Intel, I think. Uh, yeah, that's right. Well, three so, times the size. But it's not, you know, it's, it's, the, it's not their GP, you know, it's their kind of in data center capability, mm. which, you know, I mean, I know we're going to talk about AI now, but, you know, that's where the, the spend's obviously going to happen. And I think NVIDIA is poised to really capitalize on that. So, no, we don't see NVIDIA contra constraint in the sort of, you know, GPU plug-in mm. gaming cards. No, no. Yeah. In fact, Availability, you know. What did all these shortages mean for, for 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 distributors in the channel more broadly? Was there was there more a margin during that period? Um, were you able to lift margin, lift prices? Or I think you got you got to be extremely careful in distribution not to be seen as predatory. Right. You know, you've got a you've got a you've got a responsibility to stakeholders, primarily shareholders, uh, to drive profitability. But you've also got a responsibility to your stakeholders and your reseller base and your suppliers, you know. So and they'll remember you if you report. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, some of it's emotive. Some of that pricing we couldn't control. But no, we didn't say, look, you know, our, our normal cost is, two, you know, three hundred dollars. Now it's three thirty. We were making a margin of X, and now we're going to go X plus two. No, right. because no, we didn't. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't think that. Uh, I think the resellers. That's just not in our. Mm. I don't think predatory or opportunistic profit making is in our value system. To be honest, it's, well, I can tell you, it's not. It's not. Yeah. No, it's not. Mm. Um, um, no, no. Tim, let's talk a little bit about the consolidation that's happening in the markets. We mentioned 
the acquisition of Tarsus two years yeah. ago, not last year. Yeah. Um, and the de- there's the delisting, of course, of Elviva happening. There has been a, a quite, quite a lot of consolidation in recent years in the sector. Um, what, what do you th- make of this consolidation and these acquisitions, including the Tarsus acquisition? What does it mean for the industry and what does it say about the current state of the industry? From a distribution perspective? Correct. Yeah. Look, I, I think it's a mature industry. So you see that in many, many different sectors. You know, you have a, you, you have, perhaps you have an increase in the barriers to entry because it's very capital intense. So then you get a consolidation of the players, you know, and it's not an incredibly, you know, there's not these amazing returns in distribution, but if you get all your metrics right, you know, you, 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 know, you can output a good return, good return on equity, which is really what we drive. Whether our shareholder is public or private, it doesn't really matter. A shareholder still wants an investment return, you mm-hmm. know, a return on equity. And that's what we drive very hard. The consolidation within one, you know, group is not, doesn't, you know, doesn't mean that each one of those three distribution companies can make more money. You know, they're still independent competitors. Yes. You know, you've got a very um, valued competitor in, in the Mastec group with Rectron and Mastec and, and they, you know, we, they keep everybody on their toes and you've got drive control. You know, then you've got niche competitors, you know, Networks Unlimited and, and you know, an FD you know, you can't for a moment relax. Mm-hmm. So I think maybe from your side, you see an Alvivia s- consolidation, mm-hmm. but you've got drive control, you've got first tech, you've got first distribution, you've got Rectron, you've got Mustang. Mm-hmm. I mean, those are some big players, yeah. you know, and, and certainly from Pinnacle side of things, you know, they're, they're tough competitors, but they're mature competitors. You know, they don't necessarily disrupt. Mm-hmm. I think we've spoken before, Duncan, you know, there's always that question, you know, perennial question, do you see an overseas player coming in, and, and I, I mentioned about barriers to entry. There are certain South African unique factors that mm-hmm. perhaps will prevent a global, you know, we saw Ingram Micro years ago with their association with Tarsus. You know, you get the big Dubai-based, like Red Dot, mm-hmm. and those kind of guys. Are they going to come into South Africa? There are quite a few barriers to entry. Because of our uniqueness, you know, having the right credit limits in place in this sector, so I think those barriers to entry have precipitated a maturation in the kind of what you might want to call the, yeah. I think there are seven or eight big players, I think. Mm-hmm. You know? mm-hmm. So we've got th- you've got three big players in Alviva, Pinnacle, yeah. Axis, and, and now Tarsus, yeah. um, which are all run, as you mentioned, independently Correct. with their own management team, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Um, those are three separate cost bases you have within the Alviva yeah. stable. Does it not make sense at some point, possibly, to merge these three businesses into one, <laughs> or is that asking for trouble? <laughs> I think it's <laughs> got to be careful. So I think that was the question from the stakeholders. You right. know, will you see some consolidation? And I know you had Pierre on here. Yes, we did. You know, some time ago. And um, so I think his view, my view, Craig's view, Gary's view. You know, Craig, the CEO of Axis, Gary, the CEO of Tarsus, mm-hmm. is very much no. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's not. It's, it's, it doesn't always come down to cost, Duncan. There are different go-to-markets in each one of the three companies, mm. and there are different cultures. And I think sometimes people underplay the cultural you know, uh, factor. Pinnacle's go-to-market is we've got a broad customer base, we've got a broad a vendor base, and we do different products to access and Tarsus. And we actually play in a different space. So whether we're owned by Alviva or you know, a, now a new investor is really, it's sort of, you know, it's almost kind of like ShopRite's got, you know, their different sectors that they attack of the different, and so is Pick and Pay, you know, so they attack different segments with different different companies. Um, so, so no, I, I really can't see it. Um, the, the one area you could potentially look at is consolidation of logistics, mm-hmm. you know, um, and, you know, particularly in that field, Tarsus is undoubtedly the leader. Um, but, you know, there's capacity issues. You know, there's a different kind of go-to-market. Pinnacle tries to be nimble and get product out very quickly. Tarsus is very effective in mm-hmm. their sort of big distribution type. Um, so it doesn't necessarily fit the same model. Mm-hmm. Um, you can never rule that sort of thing out, but um, we've got a, a three- to four-year view of our strategy you know, um, we do a short, medium-term review every six months. And, uh, you know, our long-term view is there's no consolidation. It's not on the radar, mm-hmm. no. Mm-hmm. Interesting. 
You mentioned culture in the different organizations and the fact mm. you have different cultures. What, what is Pinnacle's culture exactly? How would you describe it? Delivering the exceptional is our, you know, it's like our brand essence. And that statement, you know, taps into a lot of different elements of service, being dynamic, honest, ethics, you know, our value system. We try and, and we do live our values. And we've got five core values which sort of link into that. There's a whole sort of bullseye that we, we try and follow. Um, in a nutshell, it's about delivering the exception on, on every level, product, technical services, service itself, financial capability, delivery, giving relief to our customers, and doing everything in a very entrepreneurial sort of way, but almost like a small business mentality in a large business framework. Mm -hmm. And that culture is getting things done. You know, get it done, look after the customer, customer first. But, you know, we've got, we've got the stakeholders of shareholder, staff, and supplier. Mm -hmm. So, you know, respecting all of those stakeholders through a value-based business approach is, is, is really our ethos. Um, you know, when you're servicing the SIMI, you know, the, we've got a broad base, 6,200 resellers. You know, Axis and Tarsus don't talk to that same sort of broad base, and they do what they do incredibly well. And, and it sort of naturally morphed that way that they service different sectors. So that requires a different cultural you know, mm -hmm. I can't really cult comment on their cultures, but I'm sure. it, it is different. Sure, sure. Do you work uh, closely with uh, the guys from Axis and, and Tarsus, or, or do you, I mean, do you collaborate when there are industry issues that need resolving? Do you, uh, or, or do, you, do you really compete with them? Uh, compete, yeah. You compete. compete yeah. They're competitors. Oh, yes. Even though yeah. they're in the yeah. same company. Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, most definitely. Yeah. You know, the whole Bidvest model, you know, Bidvest had many companies that would compete with each other. Yeah. Mm. No, no, very much so. I mean, you couldn't say that you compete with one particular player. So, for example, in the, you know, the end user compute space from a, um, I don't like to call it a tier two, but South African brand, Misa and Proline. Then mm. we compete head on with Mastec. Right. You know, and we compete head on with Mastec and Lenovo, but they don't have HP or Dell. Mm -hmm. Then we compete head on with Tarsus and HP and Lenovo um, and Dell, mm -hmm. you know, um, Axis has um, complementary products, so we both do Logitech, we both do Nutanix, but they have Cisco, we have Huawei. So in that space, Axis is probably our biggest competitor. Okay. Yeah, um, but you know, in other spaces, first distribution is our biggest. But in mm -hmm. our specialist enterprise space, then uh, for, um, Networks Unlimited, you know, is maybe a bit more of a competitor because mm -hmm. we play in different. In, in our infrastructure space, you get a different competitor. So do we collaborate to answer the second part of your question? I think there's always a degree of collaboration within any industry, you, you know, um, on you know, industry-wide issues, you know, standards, um, your approach to credit. Um, so there is, there is collaboration, yeah. I mean, I must say that the distribution industry is an absolute pleasure to be in with your competitors. You know, every there's a warm personal relationship from most of the execs to each other. You know, there's mm -hmm. no, there's no rancor or, or right. no, uh, you know, we, I mean like behind the CEO from Mastec, mm -hmm. he's a super guy and yeah. we've got a warm relationship. Same with Spencer from Rectron because mm -hmm. you often go on vendor events with that and there's a collaboration spirit. You know, if Rectron suddenly needs some stock from us, we're not going to mm -hmm. deny them that, mm -hmm. you know, we all buy from each other to fulfill the needs of our customers, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. No, it's an, it's an, it's a nice industry, right. Right? and I really mean that. that mm -hmm. You know, it's it's good. Yeah, it's healthy. It's healthy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's healthy for business. You know? Yeah, yeah. Tim, before I let you go, let's talk a bit about uh, what's coming down the pike. I don't, I don't, mm. I don't know why, but I, why that term came into my head. I'm very American. Yeah. <laughs> coming down the road uh, yes. in uh, 2023, um, you wanted to chat a little bit about AI and the impact mm. of that on the channel. Um, but what are some of the big trends you're seeing this year? So I think AI is very top of mind now. I mean, um, chat GPT is just, I, I, I mean, on a personal level, it fascinates me. Have you played with it? Yes. Yeah. yeah, I got a lot. Yeah, I mean, I'm not as technical perhaps as I should be, but it, it fascinates me. You know, like I'm a big, I, I love reading and, you know, I'm sure you read Business Day every day. There's a very clever lady there. She's got a double-barreled surname. She, you know, and then there was another guy and they, they only disclosed at the end of the article it was written by. 
GPT, right. and, and uh, just that just fascinates me. <laughs> so we started. We it got, terrifies yeah, me. Yeah, it terrifies no, 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 me. From your your <laughs> space, it must be pretty terrifying. But is it terrifying, or is it not, or is it an opportunity? You know. So, okay. So from a, a channel distribution point of view, what are the what are the applications? Not just from a human evolution point of view. From a human evolution point of view, it's fascinating. Okay from an efficiency and an automation, and that very much talks to the digital transformation journey that we embarked on probably five years ago. We try to automate and digitize every single process in our business, and to a degree, we've, we've, we've been reasonably successful, not where we want to be, but if you look at our e-commerce platform on the Adobe um, Magento 2 platform, mm -hmm. we want and we feel that we should be offering a total turnkey solution on that platform for our resellers to do everything there. Chat GPT AI based ask and give the answers is the future. So we see that application from a service level to, and the team, we've got quite a big team in that space, the digital guys, mm -hmm. they're very, super excited about it. I'm personally very excited about it. Then you look at that, what, what impact that's gonna have on the supply and the demand. It's compute, it's mm -hmm. power. Mm -hmm. So we're an NVIDIA distributor. We were a distributor of Mellanox, NVIDIA acquired Mellanox, we became an NVIDIA distributor. I think we're positioned very nicely in that space. So AI definitely, I'm sure you saw yesterday that uh, Google released BARD. BARD, yes. Yeah, yeah, I don't know what you, I don't know and if you played with it. I mean, there was nothing there, yeah. it was just a blog. It's Microsoft, Google, trying to one-up each other. Yeah, of moment, course, yeah. you know, so Microsoft's $10 billion investment in open AI, fantastic, you know, good for us. Mm -hmm. What does it mean for us as a space? People mm -hmm. can spend more on compute, mm -hmm. and then they're going to spend more on storage, and then it's high I.O. speeds that are required in those data centers, and it just continually means that there's need. So mm -hmm. very exciting there. Obviously, networking, you know, line of sight and multiple. I mean, you see this div diversified workforce that requires infrastructure, so continuing South Africa, continuing to spend money on, on, on security and all the various enhancements, you know, face recognition, all that kind of stuff. That's very much where I spend is cyber, obviously, huge, huge spend in there. I think um, IoT as a platform has never, you know, we all said that was going to be the big new mm. thing. I think there are certain um, verticals that are going to or should have taken more advantage of that. But if you think about the opportunity with AI-driven IoT, that could be a powerful platform. And I think as you're going to see AI sort of infiltrate these different platforms, then it, perhaps it makes them more relevant. So I think AI, IoT and AI, gosh, we're always talking about an acronym. Yes, yes. Right. <laughs> so if you're not in tech and you're listening to this, you think, oh, what's he talking about? <laughs> um, but that, that um, I think that's going to be, and you know, I think there's going to be good opportunities there. And then, you, you know, Windows 11, Gen 13 in the end user compute. I think, you know, I'm not too concerned about the contraction. It will come, mm. it's cyclical. It will come back in two, three quarters. So yeah. I think you'll see a, you know, a, a, a resurgence in, in demand there, um, probably in the latter half of 2023. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it, it's not going to go to sleep forever. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah. So uh, interesting, interesting times ahead. We'll keep an eye on... on Bing and chat GPT yes. and yeah, well, that's the other thing. Yeah. I mean, Bing could potentially challenge Google. Yeah, well, they're that, seeing that, it as an opportunity now. Yeah, to, very much so. To very much do that. Yeah. Suddenly, the search wars are alive again. Yep. Everyone thought Google had it was I'd all settled. It. Yeah. <laughs> Never a dull moment in this industry. No. Tim Humphreys Davies, uh, CEO of Pinnacle. Thank you so much for sharing your insights on Tech Central today. Thank you very much, Duncan. Thank you.